In this series, we're going to take a look at creating a weapon system that can support many different types of weapons and allowing our player to equip those weapons as needed. So here's just a quick demonstration of some of the weapons that I've created so far. We have something like this fireball tome. We have just a basic sword. We can equip a shield that can block attacks. There are a variety of different types of bows. This is just a normal bow. This bow can charge up shots and shoot multiple arrows like that. This sword, for example, throws a fireball. So just a large variety of different things that we can do with this system. Welcome to Barden. My name is Heinrich. And in this part, we're going to poke around the prototype that I made for the series. That is what you see in front of you right now just to get a better sense of the architecture of the system and see all the different moving parts that we're going to be working on. But before we get started, I just want to give a quick shout out to my friend Alex from the YouTube channel Alex Dev. He makes game dev related content, his editing is spectacular, and he really knows how to roast a guy. People cannot wait entire months for you to release next video. People want it now. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the project. The source code for the completed state of the project will be publicly available once the series is finished. But if you would like early access so you can poke around the completed project on your own, it is available to all of my Patreon tiers. The first thing that I need to mention is that this series does continue off of the player controller series I did before this, but you don't have to work through that to be able to follow along in this one. I will provide a starting state for this project that just includes the player controller that we're going to work off of. And I think you should still be able to get a lot of experience from this series as well. So before we look at the weapon system, let me just give an overview of the player controller in case you are just starting here. So our player controller uses a finite state machine approach. This means that all of our player's actions are grouped into relevant states so that we can focus on only certain parts of the logic without having to worry about everything else. We don't need to worry about the player's idle and move states when it's falling through the air. We only care about that when the player is actually grounded. If we take a look at our project folder, we come to our scripts folder and then come to player. Over here, we have our player states folder. So each of our player's states exists as its own class. So you can see here, for example, we have a player idle state, which is when the player is on the ground and not moving. There is something like the player in air state, which represents the player falling. Our player can also do a bunch of other things like crouch and stand still while crouching. There is a dash state, there's a ledge climb state, a move state, just a bunch of things that the character can do. And I'll give a quick demonstration just of how this controller works. So if we run around and we come out here, we have the ability to wall jump like this. We can grab onto the ledge and climb up it. We can slide down the wall like that. We can crouch, we can move while crouching. If we hold shift, we get this dash indicator that allows us to choose a direction to dash in. So just a whole bunch of different actions that we can perform. Now we're not gonna be touching any of this. So it's just to give you an idea of what the controller is currently capable of. And one more important thing to note about this finite state machine structure is that we make use of super states and substates. So you'll notice here there is a super states folder that includes the player grounded state, player touching wall state, and player ability states. So any states that share transitions to other states, for example, we can go to the in air state from both the idle and move states. In the move state, we walk off of a platform, we start falling. In the idle state, maybe the platform disappears and then we start falling. So those two states share a transition to the player in air state. And those transitions are grouped into the super states. So our player grounded state takes care of all of those transitions. I'm not gonna go too much into detail for the player controller. You can watch the player controller series if you are curious how all of that works. But one important state that we do need to know about for this series, if we come back to our substates folder, is this player attack state. The player attack state falls under our player ability super state. And this is the state that we transition to when we give combat input. So if we give our primary or secondary attack input. In the starting state of the project, this attack state will be empty, and we're going to fill in some code there throughout the series. So when we attack, our player transitions to the player attack state, and then our weapon system will take over and perform any of the relevant weapon stuff. So the player attack state is how our player controller interacts with our weapon system. 
It is how the player controller communicates with the weapon that the player currently has equipped. Another part of the player controller is the core system. If we take a look at our player game object in the hierarchy, and we just go ahead and expand this, you can see we have this core game object, which if we expand that, there is a bunch of different game objects here. So the core system is a series of scripts that an entity can reference through its core component over here that holds various functions that we want to be able to reuse. For example, the movement core component holds this movement script that just has a bunch of functions that allow us to apply velocity to the entity in different ways. Similarly, our collision senses core component holds a bunch of different checks like our ground check, our wall check, ceiling check, all these different checks. That way, all of our entities can reuse these components as needed. But also, entities don't all have to have the same core components. So the starting state of the project has a combat core component, which was our initial attempt at making a weapon system, but that has since been reworked. So it still exists, but we're going to completely rework how the combat core component works for this weapon system. Okay, so I hope I gave a good enough overview of the player controller. If you have any questions, feel free to check out the series, or if you just have super specific questions, something you don't understand, just reach out on the Discord server, and we'll be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Okay, now let's talk about the weapon system. In this scene, the weapon takes the form of four game objects. For this series, we're going to have both a primary and secondary weapon for our player. So there's two sets of these four game objects. The root game object holds the weapon script. The weapon script is how the weapon and player controller communicate. So this is what our player attack state interacts with. When the player attack state enters, it tells the weapon to start its attack. And when the weapon finishes its attack, it informs the attack state that it is now done and the player can transition back to whatever other state it needs to be in. Now note that none of the actual weapon functionality sits in the weapon script. For this system, we are heavily leaning into the component-based architecture. So let's quickly run the game and just take a look at what happens to our weapon game object when the game runs. You can see over here for our primary weapon, we have this shield equipped. And for our secondary weapon, we have a sword. So if we click on our primary game object, you can see we now have this weapon script which the weapon data has now been populated with shield one. And now there's all these other scripts. But instead of looking at the shield, let's take a look at the sword, so our secondary weapon. So our weapons functionality has been built up with all of these other scripts that have been added. For example, this attack movement script, if we go ahead and swing our sword, you can see our character moves forward like that. The attack movement script is responsible for that. After attack movement, we have these three components, which all end in on hitbox action. We'll talk about those in just a second, because we first need to talk about this weapon action hitbox. What this is, is it is the hitbox of the sword itself. And it is called weapon action hitbox because the weapon checks the hitbox on the animation's action event. So if we come to the animation window, and we quickly take a look at the sword's animations, which is actually on this base game object. You can see over here, we have an attack action trigger. So this animation event is going to trigger the weapon to check its hitbox, which if we come back to our secondary weapon game object, it's going to check the hitbox, and then it's simply going to store anything that is within that hitbox. These three other components then take whatever this has stored and does various things to it. So for example, damage on hitbox is going to damage whatever entity is within that hitbox. The knockback on hitbox action is going to knock back that entity. And the poise damage is just going to poise damage the entity, which is what leads an entity to get stunned. So if we just come right over here real quick and we hit this combat dummy, you can see that it takes damage and it gets knocked back. Let's go take a look at our shield again. And you can see we have a bunch of different components here. So if we bring up our shield, you can see that there's no movement applied to the player. So we don't need that movement component. Instead, we have a bunch of other components that just build up the shield's functionality. For example, we have this block script that is responsible for blocking any incoming attacks. We have this weapon input hold, which allows us to hold in the attack and let go to finish it. Whereas with the sword, if we click, it swings the sword. And if we hold in, nothing changes. 
our shield is also able to parry. So that's where this parry component comes in that holds all the logic for parrying an attack. Now the parry works very similar to the weapons hitbox where when something is parried, it stores whatever is getting parried and then we can do various things to it. For example, the shield damages whatever entity is parried and it also knocks back that entity. So that is how we build up a weapons logic. Now there's one more component here that we haven't talked about yet, and it's a component that is currently on both of our weapons and probably will be on all of our weapons, and that is this weapon sprite component. So this weapon sprite component is actually what makes this weapon system quite unique. But before we can talk about what that is, we quickly need to explore what the other game objects in our weapon is. So our weapon game object has three children. There is the base game object, the weapon sprite game object, and the optional sprite game object. Let's start with the base game object. So the base game object has a sprite renderer component, an animator, and a weapon animation event handler script. So the base game object is responsible for showing the player's attack animation without any weapon equipped. If we quickly actually just run the game again, and let's just pause it. If we come and enable our secondary weapon like this and we disable our weapon sprite and then come to our base game object, we can run this attack animation and you can see here that our attack animation is playing. Now notice that we can still see our character standing in the background and that is because our player controller transitions to an empty animation when we start an attack. So the base game object is responsible for showing those sprites and playing the animation based on this animator. The weapon animation event handler is responsible for broadcasting any animation events like that weapon action event, the event that indicates that an animation is finished, all those different things to the rest of the weapon components. So this script needs to sit on the same game object as the animator to have access to those events. And our weapon components can just listen to those events through this animation event handler. Now the next part is the weapon sprite game object. And you can see here that it only has a sprite renderer component. If we go ahead and quickly run the game again, note how when I attack, you can see how the sprite changes. So what's actually happening is instead of creating an animation for the base of the player's attack, so the player swinging the sword without the sword in its hand, and then another animation of the sword being swung, we are simply placing the correct weapon sprite in the sprite renderer. That way we're not creating hundreds of animations for every single potential sword that we have. All we do is we simply give the weapon the sprites for the actual sword, and based on the base animation, our weapon sprite component, this one, determines what sprite needs to be placed over here for it to line up with the attack correctly. And this is what is allowing us to create so many visually different weapons with this system. The final component that is important is this optional sprite component. Now this is something that weapons don't have to use but have the option of using. And one weapon that currently makes use of it is our bows. So if I quickly go and equip this basic bow, you'll see when I draw the bow, it has an arrow. Now this arrow is what is sitting in the optional sprite. If I click on it over here and draw it, you can see there projectile one. This allows us to have different arrow types for these different bows. For example, this crystal bow, if I draw that has this blue arrow, but I could easily swap this out for a normal brown arrow if I wanted to. So that is the purpose of the optional sprite game object. That is the basic structure of the weapons in the scene. It's simply these four game objects. And then our logic is built up of different components attached to the base game object to build up that functionality. Now you'll notice that currently none of those components are attached to the root of the weapon. So what's going on here? Now, if you wanted to, you could attach all those components and then turn your weapon into a prefab for a specific weapon and call it a day. Then when you want to equip a specific weapon, you simply delete the current weapon and instantiate that prefab and move on. But I didn't want to have to create all these weapons manually and then create and manage a bunch of different prefabs. And that is where this weapon data parameter comes in over here. So every weapon has a weapon data scriptable object. If we come to our project and then go look at the data folder over here, and then we look at weapons, 
you can see we have a bunch of scriptable objects here representing all the different weapons. Let's take a look at how these scriptable objects look. Let's look at our basic sword. If I open this and we take a look at the inspector, first you'll note that there is a bunch of custom editor buttons. Let's not worry about that just now. The scriptable object has a bunch of basic information like the weapon's name, the number of attacks that the weapon has, a description for when we equip or unequip a weapon, the pickup sprite, which is the sprite that you see floating over here, and then an animator controller. Now, the most important part is this component data's list. So over here, you can see that our sword has an attack movement data, a damage on hitbox action data, a knockback on hitbox action data, etc., etc. Now, each one of these represents one of those components that we attach to the root game object. And over here is where we can adjust the settings for those components. So if I open up this attack movement data, you can see here's another array that has three elements. And if I open that up, you can see there's attack one, attack two, and attack three. Now this corresponds with this number of attacks variable that we have over here. So we have three different sword swings. So we have a different movement that we wanna set for each one of those sword swings. If I open up attack one, you can see over here, I say, okay, for attack one, the velocity is three. For attack two, the velocity is four. And for attack three, the velocity is two. Really simple. If we take a look at our weapon hitbox data, you can see here we have another dropdown that is data that only has attack one currently. Now, I've added the option to tick this repeat data if we want to have the same data being used for every attack. So instead of having to define this three different times, I just tick this and we have one variable. But our weapon hitbox data, for example, has a rect that defines the X and Y offset of the hitbox and then the width and the height of the hitbox. Then we also have a layer mask for whatever layer we want the hitbox to actually detect things on. So in this case, it's our damageable layer. Over here then, if we take a look at our damage on hitbox action data, let me look at that. In this case, we have three again. So for attack one, we do 10 damage. For our attack two, we do 15. And for attack three, we do 20. And again, same thing for the knockback. If we open this up, you can see here we have three different uh, knockbacks. Attack one knocks back at an angle of one, one and does 10 strength knockback. So this is how we can really customize how every single attack of the weapon does things differently. So for example, our third sword swing is like an uppercut swing. So I want the knockback angle to be a lot higher, That's which is why Y is five in this case, and the knockback strength is quite high. Now, if I wanted to add another component to this sword one, let's just say, for example, our sword has some sort of charge. Now, in this case, it doesn't really make any sense, but I can just click on this button over here, which says weapon charge data, click on that. And then you can see a new component has been added to this list weapon charge data over here. If I click set weapon data attack number, you can see now we have our three different attacks for this weapon charge data. And in here we can then go and fill in all of the information needed to make this component work. But we don't want this for sword one, so I'm just going to delete that. So this is how we build up a weapon. Over here you can see the weapon sprite data, which is where we actually put in the different sprites for an attack. Now, please note that I'm not very experienced with custom editors, so I'm sure somebody who knows what they're doing can make this look a lot better. It could be fun to learn how to do that, and maybe I'll eventually I'll extend the series to do that. But for now, this is just how it works. So over here for our weapon sprites, we can, for each attack, have different attack phases. And then for each phase, we can define what the sprites are. Now, for now, unfortunately, I have to drag these in manually. It's still less work than creating a bunch of animations, but we could very easily change our script to only take in the sprite sheet and then finding these sprites automatically. But yeah, so that's what our weapon sprite data component looks like. So this is how we build up our weapons functionality by just creating a scriptable object, clicking the buttons for the functionality that we want, and simply providing it with an animator for the base animations for that attack. So what happens is when we want to change what our weapon is, when we equip a weapon or when the game starts, our weapon game object gets this data scriptable object and then loops through that list that we just looked at. So it loops through this and then attaches the right components accordingly.
And so that's basically how this weapon system works. I'm sure that was a lot to take in. It's okay if you don't understand everything that has happened so far. I just wanted to expose you a little bit to the complexities of what we're about to work on. That way, when we start working on it, not everything is completely foreign and we kind of know what we're working towards. So there's also a whole bunch of other things going on here that I didn't explain in depth because again, those things need to be saved for their own episodes. And I'm planning on making these episodes really short, focusing on small single parts of this weapon system and I'm super excited to get into it. So let me know how I did in the comments if I if you think you kind of understand what's going on. If you have no idea, let me know. Feel free to ask questions on Discord. I'm always happy uh, to try and discuss things. Again, like I mentioned, if you want to dig around the source code early, head over to my Patreon. It will be available there. But the first episode of actually creating the system will be out next week. So it won't be too long if you want to get access to the code that way. So I look forward to developing the system with you guys. And before I go, I would just like to say thank you to all of my supporters and wonderful people over on Patreon. And a huge special thank you to Cody, SM, Madger, Jake, Patrick, Atami, and Mike for your support on Patreon. You guys are absolute mad lads. And I hope you guys all have a lovely day.